All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'll uh, start the uh, GI uh, plenary uh, session. We have uh, designed two debates, uh, one in esophageal cancer and one in rectal cancer that will hopefully take on some key issues that you're facing in the clinic as you try to think about how to improve uh, care for these patients. Um, the, our format will be a little bit different than the uh, head and neck uh, cancer debate format because of the uh, differences in time. There will be two 20-minute presentations and then there will be five minutes for the, an off-the-cuff uh, rebuttal and panel discussion with questions. Um, I'm sure this will be very similar to the uh, uh, Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, um, although the total amount of dollars exchanged might be different. Uh, Mayweather-Pacquiao grossed uh, $410 million in U.S. revenue alone. Um, we're not quite expecting to, to get that, but it, in, con in contrast, it makes your ACRO membership and the cost of this meeting seem uh, not that much. Um, and the actual belt that they win um, is uh, valued at a million dollars worth of gold and emeralds. Um, no such prize will be given to the winner of this, uh, of this event. Um, our first debate is under the question, with current techniques in unresectable locally advanced esophageal cancer, is it uh, taking the position of 50.4 grays, the most appropriate dose, is uh, Dr. Michael Haddock, and uh, taking the uh, position of 60 plus gray or some sort of dose escalated strategy is the most appropriate dose, is uh, Dr. Ravi Sridhar. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Haddock first. Uh, he had a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from BYU. Um, his MD is from the University of Washington. He did his residency at the Mayo Clinic and is now a professor of uh, radiation oncology and associate professor of oncology at the Mayo Clinic. He's been a leader um, in ECASOG and NCCTG cooperative groups for a number of years. Um, his research uh, focuses on a number of uh, GI radiation oncology related topics, but specifically including quality of life and bowel function following pelvic uh, radiation. And uh, obviously he's been one of the leaders in the Mayo protocol for chemo radiation followed by liver transplant for cholangia carcinoma. He has over 100 uh, publications. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Haddock, for coming. Thank you for the invitation. I don't know if I'm uh, Floyd or Manny. Uh, you didn't tell me that. Um, and this is my disclosure. And this is the debate that we were asked to, uh, to have today. And I get to choose uh, or get to defend the side of 50 gray or 50.4 gray as being the appropriate dose. And this is the proposition uh, for locally advanced esophageal cancer treated with curative chemoradiation, the most appropriate radiation dose is 50.4 gray. And just a couple of assumptions at the beginning. Um, we're talking about uh, stages T2 to 4, node negative or node positive, non-metastatic patients. We're not talking about T1A patients for whom there are other options. We're talking about a patient that is being treated with curative intent, uh, someone who's a good candidate for chemotherapy, and we're talking about it in the non-operative setting. And finally, uh, this is a debate, so I get to present just one side of the issue and maybe be a little less balanced than uh, otherwise. So this is the type of patient uh, that we're going to talk about. You can see a very large uh, esophageal cancer, distal esophageal cancer in this patient. Uh, FDG Abbott is on PET as they usually are. Uh, and no metastatic disease on the PET scan. So this is a, the, the typical patient, and we're going to talk about what's the best dose. And I'm going to try to paint a picture in four different areas. We're going to look at the dose data from adjuvant trials, because I think there's something we can learn there about what dose we should be using. And then we'll look at dose data from non-operative trials. Uh, and then we'll look at local control as a function of dose. Um, we all want to believe that if we give more dose, we'll have better local control. Uh, and uh, if a little bit of radiation works, more radiation must be better. That's, that's just kind of uh, ingrained in us. But I think we have to look at the data and challenge that assumption as whether or not it's true in esophageal cancer. And finally, we'll, we'll look at toxicity as a function of dose. And what I'll argue is that all four of these areas would suggest that there's no reason to give more than 50.4 gray. So let's talk about the trimodality setting. So there are a number of trials that have been done showing that chemoradiation works in the preoperative setting for esophageal cancer. This was the uh, Walsh study, 113 patients, all adenocarcinomas. But look at the dose, it was 40 gray, 40 gray in 15 fractions. And in this study, the surgery essentially cured nobody, but adding 40 gray uh, resulted in a significantly higher cure rate. This is the, uh, an Australian study. This is a mixture of uh, squamous cell and adenocarcinoma patients. And if you look at the dose on this study, it was 35 gray. And with just 35 gray, they cut the local recurrence rate in half. 
And looking at the squamous cell subset, this is progression-free survival. You can see that the progression-free survival is significantly better with just a, a low dose. And this is the German study, the so-called POET study. These are all GE junction adenocarcinoma patients. It was a study of preoperative chemotherapy, uh, which they gave uh, platinum and 5-FU. And then on one of the arms, they gave 30 gray in 15 fractions. Uh, much lower dose than we've done in any U.S. studies, just 30 gray uh, over three weeks with platinum and etoposide, interestingly enough. And what they saw is that that improved essentially every endpoint. Uh, significantly, they had, despite giving three cycles of very aggressive chemotherapy, almost never had a pathologic CR until you added that 30 gray. And adding 30 gray, uh, you had uh, eight times uh, the number of pathologic complete responses. It also had about a 30% increase in the number of patients that were node negative at the, at the time of surgery, and I'll show you why that's important in a minute. And the survival was better. So these are the survival curves according to whether or not the patient was node negative or not. And you can see that patients who were node positive after neoadjuvant therapy, they didn't have any long-term survivors, and all the long-term survivors were in the pathologic node negative group. Uh, so I point out this data to show you that 30 gray in 15 fractions sterilized lymph nodes on this trial. This is the survival. Some argue that it's not significant because the p-value is 0.07, but this is essentially a positive trial if you look at the difference, uh, quite a large separation in those arms. And this is the freedom from local tumor progression. So the radiation did what we would expect it to do, is it prevented local relapses. Uh, moving to more modern studies, the CROSS trial used a dose of 41.4 gray uh, in conjunction with carboplatinum paclitaxel and showed a significant improvement in survival. And interestingly enough, they had a pathologic complete response rate of 23% for adenos and almost 50% for squamous cell cancers. Uh, so 41.4 gray uh, had a 50% pathologic complete response rate, so gross disease uh, completely eliminated with 41.4 gray. And those are the survival curves. Chemoradiation surgery significantly better on this trial. And not only was the local recurrence rate better, uh, we, we know that uh, having better local control sometimes translates into better distant control because the distant metastases usually come from the local disease. And they had fewer peritoneal metastases and fewer hematologic metastases on the radiation arm. And interestingly, the, the relapse rate in the radiation fields is only 5%. So despite this being a very low dose, it was very effective in controlling disease in the radiation fields. And then finally, this is the last adjunct study I'll show you, the CLGB study, which was planned to be a very large study, closed early because of poor accrual. And this is the highest dose that I've shown you yet, and we're all the way up to 50.4 gray. And that was also effective in the trimodality setting with significantly better survival, even though there were only 56 patients entered on the study. So these are the five studies that I just showed you. And if you look at the doses, uh, 40, 30, 30, 41.4, and 50.4, all of those produce significant uh, rates of pathologic complete response, ranging from about 25 all the way up to uh, 40 and 50 percent. So gross disease controlled with very low doses of radiation. So now let's look at uh, what's been done in the non-operative setting. What do we know about radiation dose? And I'm going to show you some historical data because there's really not a lot of information about dose. It's very difficult to uh, find studies examining dose, although there are some. And I think there's something that can be learned from the historical setting. Sometimes we, we forget the history. Even when we go on to the next trial, sometimes we forget what we learned in the last one. So here's some older data from China where they looked at these patients were treated with cobalt-60. but what they found is as you escalated the dose beyond 50, the survival went in the other direction. So they had a 15% uh, five-year survival at 50 gray, and went down to 7% 7, 7 with 70 gray. Uh, this is the original pilot data on which the RTOG uh, landmark study was based, and they had about 90 patients with radiation 5 if you and platinum. And 50 of those went to surgery, and they had a pathologic complete response rate of 24% with a dose of 30 gray in 15 fractions. That's about, uh, about the same uh, number of patients that are cured as that past CR rate. So the next thing they did is they did a 22-patient pilot study, and sometimes people forget this or don't know this data. Uh, they increased the dose to 50 gray, not based on any data, just because they decided that, that since they weren't going to go to surgery, maybe they needed more dose. 
And what they found is that three of the 18 patients had a marginal relapse when they used uh, five centimeter uh, margins. So they actually modified the fields to include the entire esophagus in the supraclavicular re region to a dose of 30 grade 15 fractions and completely eliminated the, uh, the marginal relapse issue. Uh, and I point that out, that's important because it may be that giving higher and higher doses to smaller and smaller volumes is actually the exact wrong thing to do with esophageal cancer. The data is consistent with uh, the hypothesis that giving uh, less dose to larger volumes might actually cure more patients. So this was the 8501 study. Uh, one of the arms had 64 gray in it. That arm didn't cure anybody. Uh, one arm had 50 gray and 25 fractions and uh, cured about a fourth of the patients. That's the survival shown there. And it also improved local control. This is time to local failure according to the treatment arm. And a lower dose of radiation with chemotherapy was better than 64 gray. Now, this is a study you probably don't, uh, don't read about. Uh, this is an ECOG study. It was small, radiation with or without bleomycin. But it's interesting because their dose was 50 gray at the beginning. And partway through the study, they decided that wasn't enough. So they amended the protocol and gave the rest of the patients 60 gray. Um, and then they looked at their dose, uh, analyzed the results as to whether or not they received less than 55 or greater than 55, and didn't find any difference in survival. There's actually a randomized study coming out of China where they, uh, these patients were treated with cobalt, uh, 221 patients, and they randomized them to 50 gray versus 70 gray in 35 fractions. Absolutely no difference in five-year survival, but they did find that about 10% of the patients in the high-dose arm were unable to finish the radiation. So there's actually been a study with chemoradiation on both arms uh, directly uh, answering the question that we're trying to debate today. Uh, RTOG 9405, 50.4 gray in, in one arm, and the experimental arm was 64.8 gray. And these were all uh, uh, patients uh, with esophageal cancer, either squamous cell or adenocarcinoma patients. And these were the results. 50.4 uh, gray was actually better than 64.8 gray. Uh, so the, the phase three level one evidence is that dose escalation is not only uh, not better, it's actually a little bit worse. Well, let's go to the next, next topic. Let's look at local control. We want to believe that if we give more dose, we'll have better local control. We have 50% local failure rates. Uh, so it's easy to want to believe that if we just gave more radiation, our local control would be better. So here's some historic data from uh, Mass General. Uh, they looked at some patients and, and divided them into dose bins, looking at doses between 50 and 70 gray, looked at local failure, didn't find any impact of higher doses on the local failure rate. 65 to 69 gray had a 50% local failure rate, the same as 50 to 55 gray. And of course, the, the RTOG 9405 study, uh, we know that part of the reason that the high-dose arm was worse is that there were, there were more treatment-related deaths, even though most of them occurred at doses uh, below 50.4 gray. Um, but we might have expected that uh, the 64.8 gray would at least give better local control, and actually it didn't. The local regional failure number was higher on that arm than on the lower-dose arm. And, and this is the time to, to local failure curve. And you can see that there's no hint at all that going to 64.8 gray with 5 of and platinum controlled any more patients. So the data is really consistent with the hypothesis that there's a subset of patients that are controlled with uh, relatively modest doses. And it may be that the rest of the patients are never going to be controlled with radiation or would take doses that are completely not tolerable. So this is the, the fourth area and final area. Uh, radiation dose and toxicity. What do we know about the impacts of uh, radiation, escalating the radiation dose on toxic effects? There have been a number of efforts uh, to uh, increase the radiation dose. Here was one that the RTOG did. And they gave 50 gray with 5-FU and platinum, and then they tried dose escalation with high-dose rate brachytherapy. They gave 5 gray times 3 fractions and then changed it to 5 gray times 2. And the problems that they had uh, were toxicity. They had 26% grade 4 and 8% grade 5 and 12% fistula. And in fact, if you look at the R2G series of studies looking at dose escalation, uh, including the intergroup study that I already showed you, as well as the pilot study before the intergroup study and the brachytherapy study, 
All three of those studies looking at dose escalation had a grade five toxicity rate of 10%. So it wasn't just the brachytherapy uh, study, it was every external beam study also had a grade five toxicity rate of 10%. Uh, so escalating the dose is not free. And it doesn't do you any good to cure the esophageal cancer and end up with a patient that looks like this. So here's the problem. Here's a 3D plan looking at the 40 gray isodose cloud, and you can see how much of the heart is in the 40 gray volume. And if you want to do anything about that and reduce the dose to the heart, then you have to put the dose in the lungs because the dose has to go somewhere. And so uh, we might say, well, with modern techniques, we could give higher dose. So here's a VMAP plan going to 50.4 gray and 28 fractions, and you, you can see uh, what happens. Uh, these are what would be considered acceptable numbers. The lung mean is only 13.6 gray. The V20 is 19%. Uh, the heart mean in this plan is 31.6 gray. And so this is what we can do with modern techniques. Uh, using, you see how big the tumor is. With a big tumor like this, the V5 ends up being 100%, and there's actually no way to avoid that if you've got a tumor that goes from uh, the top of the thorax to the bottom. So uh, you can pick your poison. This is what happens if you put the dose in the lungs. Uh, these are two publications from MD Anderson, different numbers of patients. Uh, and it shows pulmonary complications as a function of mean dose to the lung. You can see uh, in both, uh, both publications, as we get up uh, above the 15 gray mean dose to the lung level, you can really see an increase in the rate of pulmonary complications. What about heart? We can take it out of the lungs and put it in the heart. This is the Darby data from breast cancer, uh, where they give much lower doses of, uh, of radiation to the breast than we do in esophageal cancer. So they had 2,000 breast cancer patients followed for 10 years. And what is shown on this graph is the increase in uh, significant coronary events per gray of dose to the heart. And what we've extrapolated to that orange curve is the range for where we are with esophageal cancer. So we're kind of off their chart. But this is what they found, is that if you looked at various time periods after radiation, you had about a 15% increase in major coronary events in the fir uh, first 10 years per, in per single gray increase. Uh, so if we had a mean dose of 20 gray to the heart, uh, time 15% 15, 15 per gray, we would have a 300% increase in the rate of major coronary events in the first 10 years following radiation. So anything we do with dose escalation is going to increase uh, the amount of dose that we give to the heart. There's just no way around that. And the data actually suggests that that's, that, 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 that is what happens. Uh, so here's some data out of China, 101 patients, they gave them definitive chemoradiation. 28% uh, had a pericardial effusion. There weren't any clinical factors associated with the pericardial effusion rate, but the radiation dose to the heart was strongly correlated with it, and all dose levels, including the V5, the V30, the mean, all correlated with the risk of, of cardiac morbidity. And then uh, this study, which was just published this year, uh, this is modern technique radiation with uh, chemoradiation. It's uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, so we're not treating the esophagus, but it, almost the same volume being treated. And so these patients were randomized either 60 or 74 gray with weekly carbo and taxol. And what they found is that uh, on multivariate analysis, the heart V5 and the V30 were significant independent predictors for survival. Uh, so the more dose you gave to the heart, the lower the survival was. Uh, so if we're going to argue for dose escalation, how are we going to do it without increasing the dose to the heart or the lungs? And I don't think uh, that the solution is going to be treat everybody with proton beam therapy, which is the plan shown on the right, because that's just really not going to be an option for everyone with esophageal cancer. So to conclude, uh, I think what I've shown you is that doses as low as 30 gray up to 50 gray have been proven to be effective in the adjuvant setting. Uh, that dose range works. It controls gross disease very low local relapse rates uh, after that's combined with surgery. And I think I've also shown you that doses of 30 to 50 gray have been effective in the primary setting. And we don't actually have, we really don't have data that, that proves to us that 50 gray is better than 30 gray. Uh, that's, that's never been studied, it's just been assumed. We don't really have evidence of improved local control with doses greater than 50.4 gray. So uh, before 
we expose patients to the increased toxicity risk, we would at least want to show that higher doses improve the local control. And we have very strong evidence of increased toxicity as we escalate the dose. Uh, in the lung cancer study, I showed you everyone wanted to believe that higher doses would cure more patients, and it, it just isn't what was seen. It was the opposite. So I think to conclude, uh, uh, I, we would have to conclude that 50.4 gray or 50 gray would be the appropriate dose to use in conjunction with two-drug chemotherapy. And with that, we'll turn the podium over to Ravi. Thank you very much. That was excellent. And now to present the uh, counterpoint is uh, Dr. Ravi Sridhar. Um, did his medical training at Wayne State, has a PhD in pharmacology, residency also at uh, Carmona's Cancer Institute at Wayne State, and uh, uh, then was the chief of GI oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. More recently, he's uh, practicing at the Florida Hospital Medical Group in Orlando, Florida. He has extensive research background in esophageal cancer and in stereotactic body radiation therapy for uh, abdominal uh, and GI sites. Um, he's a leader in the Astro e-contouring session for, uh, for esophageal cancer and has more than 100 publications and has uh, done a lot of work in uh, dose escalation in, uh, in esophageal cancer. Dr. Sridhar. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Haddock did an excellent job presenting uh, the abundance of data suggesting that uh, dose escalation may actually be detrimental. But what I want to emphasize is if you looked at the years of those studies, 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, this is all prior to the uh, implementation of advanced technology and some of the other things uh, that are going on. And a lot of these older studies were also utilizing 1.8 gray fractions with uh, you know, long course of treatment, you know, six, seven, eight weeks of treatment. And I think we have data to suggest, at least in the squamous cell setting, that, you know, 1.8 gray fractions for gross disease is probably inferior. We know that from head and neck. We also know from head and neck that prolonging treatment time um, is also going to be a factor for local control. Um, but we'll go ahead. So while I have no disclosures to report, I will admit that Dr. Haddock was my oral board examiner for GI. And when it came to the esophageal question, I have to admit, I did lie and say I use 50.4 with the 3D conformal technique. In reality, that's not how I actually practice, but no take backs, it's too late, I passed. <laughs> All right, so the objective work will review uh, only prospective data. There's retrospective data out there that suggests doses above 55 uh, are beneficial. There's others that contradict that, but I'm not gonna go through all the retrospective data. The, the, they're always fraught with problems. We'll discuss the potential benefit of dose escalation actually in the preoperative setting, uh, discuss advanced technologies, and then uh, possibly discuss hypo or hyperfractionation schedules that have been uh, published. So except for very early stage disease, the majority of esophageal cancer patients will be treated with either preoperative or definitive chemo radiation. Whether you add induction or adjuvant chemotherapy, that's still questions that are ongoing. We know radiation alone is palliative and uh, response and survival are enhanced with concurrent chemotherapy. So uh, basically what I'm gonna present are only the trials, uh, prospective trials that have been done uh, that have not used induction chemotherapy and that only use chemo radiation. So, we know preoperative and definitive doses have uh, been established in the range of 4140 from the cross trial uh, to 50.4 uh, from the uh, RTOG 8501. However, we still have a significant amount of residual disease that's left that can grow, progress, obstruct, and cause significant uh, uh, problems with quality of life. Um, we know that uh, in the definitive setting, most of the local failures do occur within the GTV or within very close to it. Local regional uh, recurrence has been documented in the range of 15 to 33 percent in the preoperative setting. So even though you get response and it's out, it can, it's still likely to recur. Uh, pathologic complete response in the preoperative setting uh, is in the range of 25 to 40 percent, but when you looked at Dr. Haddock's tables, you, you couldn't find a dose correlation at all. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of that as well. So these are the, this is the classic argument against dose, dose escalation, and I think Dr. Haddock uh, 
pointed out a lot of the problems with the uh, intergroup trial, or RTOG 9405. Uh, we know that most of the deaths did occur in patients with the, who didn't receive the, uh, even the uh, control dose. We know that in this trial it was actually detrimental for survival and no benefit on local control. But there has been uh, evolving data. Uh, this is a, a study out of China uh, published in 2005. It was a prospective randomized trial that compared surgery versus definitive chemoradiation uh, for squamous cell carcinoma. The chemoradiation patients did receive 5-FU and 60-gray, uh, cisplatin 5-FU and 60-gray uh, concurrently. Uh, median follow-up was 17 months, no difference in overall disease-free survival between the groups, but in the, and you can see in the chemoradiation patients, two-year survival was 58.3%. Uh, you had an uh, endoscopic uh, complete response of 92%, uh, local failure of only 17% in the uh, chemoradiation patients, and while the surgery patients tended to recur in the mediastinum, the chemoradiation patients tended to recur kind of in the cervical and uh, abdominal lymphatics. Hence why in RTOG 8501, they treated supercleft at GE junction. Uh, this was the uh, other, there were, there were basically three trials that addressed the role of surgery for squamous cell carcinoma. This is the French study. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the German study because they actually had an induction chemotherapy component, but in this French study, uh, they took patients, treated them with 46 gray in two gray fractions, um, and then they assessed response and then were randomized to surgery, or they got an extra 20 gray or, or 15 gray split course. Uh, the majority of patients got 20 gray. They cl actually closed down the 15 uh, gray split course um, after uh, an initial evaluation. There was no difference in survival between the two arms with surgery. However, you can see median survival in the, chemo radi in the chemoradiation patients was 19.3 months, which um, is much better than what occurred in the um, intergroup trial. The two-year overall survival was 40%, also uh, better than the intergroup trial. And the two-year local control um, was 57%. So this is at two years now, not at one year uh, the, that was uh, published in, in intergroup. So at two years, they're getting the same one-year local control as uh, what, what happened in the intergroup. And toxicities, it, while there was a uh, double-digit rate of grade three toxicities, most of them were hematologic. If you look at the bottom uh, part, you can see uh, from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, esophagitis, the toxicities were all in the single-digit range. So it, this, going to this elevated dose was not fraught with a lot of toxicity. Another study out of China where they looked at uh, 66 gray IMRT versus 60 gray IMRT chemoradiation, and the chemoradiation patients, uh, where there was 75, had a five-year overall survival of 30%, but still you can see that uh, the local regional relapse rate at, um, was 51%. But, so let's, so in that trial they did use uh, IMRT. So let's ta uh, take a few minutes just to discuss what's happened since the majority of those trials uh, have occurred. Uh, I think the majority of us are now using PET-CT fusion. Uh, I've been using fiducial markers to help delineate the gross tumor volume in the esophagus, have my uh, endoscopist place it at the time of EUS. Uh, we're now using daily image guidance with either comb beam or KV setups. Uh, we're assessing for respiratory motion with 4D CT scans and then implementation of IMRT or simultaneous integrated boost IMRT. This is a figure from a paper we published on the use of fiducial markers in esophagus. You can see on the top panel, that's the uh, uh, simulation scan. You can see that the fiducials uh, delineate uh, the tumor and correlates with uh, PET-CT fusion. We can use it on daily image guidance to ensure that the target is being treated, and you can see that they're stable afterwards. Can you uh, play this? We know that uh, tumors move with respiration, especially in the esophagus. And oh, you can just play this, or, yep. There we go. So you can see there's, there's anterior posterior motion, 
Uh, on the other ones, you would have seen there's superior inferior motion, there's radial motion, so these tumors move a lot. So if you don't account for these things, you're gonna miss, and that missing target could also affect response and local control. And you can see that uh, this was a paper published uh, describing um, the respiratory mo uh, uh, motions of esophageal tumors, and it can vary as much as two and a half, almost two and a half centimeters. Uh, we've, we sometimes use abdominal compression in those patients that have uh, large movements to reduce the movements. Uh, my resident at Moffitt, who is now faculty, uh, looked at uh, patients that we treated with and without abdominal compression. And we looked at the 4D CT scans and assessed the motion, and we, were, we showed that the abdominal compression was actually able to reduce respiratory motion by at least 50%. Daily image guidance. You can see with the cone beam CTs, uh, this is the fusion. You can see that the, uh, what I'm uh, showing as the uh, gross tumor volume is uh, the fiducials are within that gross tumor volume, suggesting that you know, we, are now, we know we're hitting the target every day when we're doing these daily image guidance. Um, and with using daily image guidance, you can see that uh, there is um, setup variation. Um, in this study with, uh, it, it's not a lot in this study. We sometimes see even sometimes a centimeter shift, uh, but in this study it was uh, probably not more than five millimeters. But if you're using IMRT and you're using, you know, very tight margins, that five millimeters makes all the difference in the world. Uh, IMRT, I think uh, Dr. Haddock had a nice plan showing uh, differences with 3D conformal and, and VMAT plans. Uh, you can see the panel on panel A, uh, that's a 3D conformal plan uh, going to 50.4 gray. Um, in panel B, it's a uh, uh, VMAT plan going to 50.4. And then in C, that's actually using a simultaneous integrated boost, focusing in on the tumor and giving the regional lymphatics uh, a, a lower uh, microscopic dose using a VMAT plan. You can see the isodose distributions are significantly better um, and probably can give you some heart and lung sparing um, but again, size and location of the tumor are definitely going to affect um, how, how uh, coverage is going to be affected. So we know that uh, there have been a couple of series that have been published comparing 3D versus IMRT. The MD Anderson series uh, had almost 800 patients. They showed that um, there was a survival benefit associated with the use of IMRT. Uh, their hypothesis was that uh, the 3D patients were, were dying because of cardiac uh, doses, um, and there were cardiac deaths attributed to that, and that's probably what led to the difference in survival. Um, we published our series uh, at Moffitt comparing 3D versus IMRT. We didn't have as many patients or as long a follow-up. We didn't see a survival difference uh, per se, but we did see a significant reduction in overall grade 3 toxicity and hospitalizations as well. So utilizing uh, some of these new technologies, uh, we can see that, uh, another randomized trial in, in China comparing uh, hyperfractionated boost after conventional treatment with and without chemotherapy. Uh, the radiation was initially to 4140 to large fields and then coned down using 1.5 BID to 27 for a total dose of 68.4. Median overall survival, there was no difference in survival between conventionally fractionated or hyperfractionated, but in these hyperfractionated patients going to the higher dose, you can see that the median overall survival was 31 months, uh, five-year overall survival 40%, 26% uh, with local regional uh, recurrences for its failure, and you can see the local control is uh, excellent with uh, one-year local failure at 16%, five-year local failure at 33%. But Implementing a hyperfractionated boost at the end of treatment may not be convenient for all patients, and this was actually one of the conclusions in their study. Um, and then they decided to uh, come up with a different treatment regimen, uh, the same group, the phase two study, 45 patients treated with simultaneous integrated boost IMRT uh, with chemo radiation. Um, you can see the dose fractionation, 1.8 and 2.25, so now we're actually going hypofractionated. Um, to a total dose of 50.4 and 63 gray to the gross disease, three-year overall survival, 42%, median overall survival, 21 months. You can see excellent local control. Uh, there was no grade four or five toxicity. There was no grade three pulmonary toxicity. Grade two and three esophagitis in total was 64%, but of which only 13% had grade three. So now when we look at the table, uh, 
um, we can clearly see that going to doses above 60 gray is not detrimental. Uh, I think the intergroup trial was fraught with bad luck and, and bad patients. I think even in that trial, they allowed up to KPS 60, uh, which would not be done in any clinical trial today. Uh, so you can see with the different regimens and the different dosing uh, that there is a suggestion that we are getting long-term durable survival and probably improved local control. Now we're comparing, these are across studies, there's no direct comparison, but there's a suggestion that, you know, utilizing uh, modern technology, we might be able to uh, get improved outcomes. Finally, this uh, Chinese study uh, was uh, just completed the phase one, uh, and you can, you can see in dose level four, they're going up to 70 gray and 2.8 gray for a fraction of the gross disease uh, and giving 50.4 uh, to the uh, remaining disease. There was one grade five due to disease progression in ARM2, uh, which was uh, tumor-associated esophageal perforation and hemorrhage. They enrolled another five patients onto that and saw no complications, and that's why they were able to go to uh, level three and level four. Now, overall, the one-year overall survival is 70%, with local control being 77%. Um, you can see there were the tumor locations. Uh, they had both upper, middle, and uh, lower in almost an equal distribution. Um, and these are the rates of, um, uh, of the toxicity. And not, it's not dramatic at all. You can see we're talking single digit numbers of some esophagitis, but uh, in grade three, there were only two. So just briefly on the preoperative setting, we know that this is fraught. If you look, compare across trials, lots of heterogeneity. The proportion of squamous cell versus adenocarcinoma is also highly variable. Choice of chemotherapy regimen is also different between trials. Dose and fractionation are all over the place. Some using hypofractionated, some using conventionally fractionated, some using hyperfractionated, some using split course. Um, some trials were underpowered. Uh, there's no consistent correlation between radiation dose and pathologic response, um, and no prospective data comparing different uh, radiation doses preoperatively. So this is kind of a summary of all that, and you can see the uh, different dosing and chemotherapy schedules associated with the pathologic complete response. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, real good correlation uh, with that. And then also, uh, if you look at the um, variability in the differences between uh, the use, uh, the inclusion of adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas, you can also see it's kind of all over the place, suggesting that there may not be a real difference um, in response uh, to squamous cell and adenocarcinoma as, you know, sometimes you, we're seeing less and less of the squames and they're probably more underrepresented. So when you do get a good response, um, it is probably showing as, as more significant, but uh, in general, we're seeing no correlation with dose and response. So I'll briefly, so in 2009, we began uh, utilizing uh, simultaneous integrated boost or dose painting IMRT on most patients. We were noticing that the, a lot of the patients we were treating, um, especially in Florida, being a more elderly population, we were seeing maybe only about 50% that were actually going on to surgery. Uh, a number of issues either with um, uh, you know, travel, uh, social situations, nutritional uh, problems, or they were just medically inoperable to begin with. Um, and the other issue was if they became metastatic on restaging um, and they still had significant amount of local disease, um, you know, that could also affect nutritional status, which can also affect um, uh, getting systemic chemotherapy. So we talked with our surgeons, so this wasn't just done <laughs> blindly. We talked to them and they were also concerned about the number of patients who weren't going to surgery. So we said we can bump up the dose a little bit just to make sure we can get maybe a little bit extra uh, bang for our buck so that uh, we're actually controlling the esophageal tumor. So we took a look at the patients that received only 50.4 or that we used the 50, 40, uh, 56 gray to gross disease. We had 40 patients uh, that were treated with IMRT chemoradiation and 73 patients that, were, that received the simultaneous integrated boost. Uh, the main difference between these uh, two groups of patients uh, was that the, uh, we were waiting, they, they got to surgery a little bit later. Uh, we're talking about um, 10 weeks, maybe versus 12 weeks 
Um, at that point, what is the real difference uh, between more evolution response? We know that the difference between six weeks and 12 weeks for colorectal can buy you about 6%, but the difference between 10 weeks and 12 weeks probably is not going to affect response all that much. But that was the main difference. Uh, you can see the acute toxicities that we recorded during treatment. There were no difference between the two groups. We only saw about a 6.5% uh, weight loss. Um, you can see hospital admissions uh, were, were similar. Uh, patients requiring stent were also similar. And we also did not see any increase in radiation pneumonitis. Perioperative complications, the only thing that we found was there was a slight increase uh, there was a statistically significant increase in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a common uh, perioperative problem after esophagectomy. We did see it a little bit higher, and probably because the majority of the patients that we treated were uh, distal and GE junction, po possibly the increased dose to the right atrium uh, is probably what resulted in atrial fibrillation, although we're still going back to tease out the dosimetric parameters. In terms of response, uh, we see a dramatic increase in pathologic complete response. Uh, we 55% versus 30%. And then if you look, and the TRG is a tumor regression grading scale that was adopted by the College of American Pathology, zero being a complete response, three being no response. And you can see in the, the degree of non-responders uh, also went down uh, significantly. Local control, local regional recurrence was also improved, uh, statistically significant. We saw an improvement in relapse-free survival. However, we did not see a difference in overall survival, although you can see the curves are uh, staying separate. Um, we didn't see any difference in distant metastases as well. So in conclusion, uh, dose escalation for esophageal cancer is feasible in the modern era and is not detrimental, as was shown in the intergroup trial. Uh, utilizing advanced technology, there may be a role for safe dose escalation, which data suggests might translate into improved local control and survival without added toxicity. The caveat is all data for the dose escalation has been done in the squamous cell population, and no data for adenocarcinoma. So I would not advocate doing dose escalation trials where we extend the treatment beyond six weeks. I think we know overall treatment time is a prognostic factor for local control and survival, and um, doing seven, eight weeks of treatment uh, doesn't make sense uh, in this day, given what we can uh, do with the treatment. And also considering we're trying to bring the cost down and not increase the cost, uh, I think using a technique like simultaneous integrated boost can safely dose escalate the tumor without adding more treatment. Uh, there is no prospective data comparing pre-op doses, but we show that dose does correlate with pathologic response and local control. Uh, however, we do need um, prospective data for adenocarcinoma, and I think we need to revisit um, doing another dose comparison trial. Uh, in the lung trial, they looked at 60 versus 74. We're still stuck at 50. I think the, I think the threshold for probably getting that is probably going to be in the neighborhood of, you know, between 60 and 64 gray. Um, but, so I'm not advocating going as high as 70 as, they, as I showed in the, one, in the one phase one trial, but I, I think certainly given all that we can do now and how patients are managed uh, nutritionally uh, much better uh, today and better identification of, of patients, uh, I think uh, we need to really uh, visit this question again. Thank you. I'll give a few minutes if uh, people have uh, any questions they'd like for the panel, or just to give a chance for uh, you to give any rebuttal statements if you ha if you have any. Well, I had a question for the panel about um, the, the treatment volume. Um, there was a paper I think last year from Anderson. If you radiate both ends of the anastomosis for patients who have a subsequent esophagectomy, that they had much higher leak rate in the 30% range versus those who didn't have both ends irradiated. It was less than 5 or 10%, as I recall. Uh, any thoughts about that? So you're asking about appropriate treatment volume? Yes. Patients so are going if you to have a, a GE junction cancer, this adenocarcinoma, and it's 6 centimeters, you know, going cranially, um, you know, you start radiating to the subcranial node or the pretracheal nodes, you know, right up to where you're going to be at the aortic or HAP window region. But then you got to go down and treat, you know, nodes around the celiac axis and superior artery. You got a pretty large field that you're treating. Right. 
And when they do the esophagectomy and they pull it up and they're anastomosing, you may be, have radiated both ends of that anastomosis, and that is associated with much higher leak rate. Yeah, I, if, you look at the, if you look at the data, the one study that showed that this works, they treated the entire thoracic esophagus. Now, I don't do that, that was, anymore. That was to 30 gray, right? It was to 30 gray. Um, and, and in the very next study, in the dose escalation study, based on zero data, they decided to use five centimeter margins even knowing that they had marginal relapses. And you do see marginal relapses mainly in the squamous cell population. Now, I still use five centimeter margins uh, on the mucosa for both adenos and squames, but I wonder if that's the right thing to do with squamous cell patients. I do see patients who relapse above the fields, and we retreat them in those cases. But uh, so I use a five centimeter mucosal margin. I don't know if. Yeah. Um, so, like most of the squames, I th you know, we do see occasional distal squames, but most of them are still kind of upper and mid. And when I'm doing upper and mid, just because I'm extending my field to cover supraclavicular lymph nodes, I'm already probably at that 5, 6 cm margin. I definitely cover 5 centimeters distally. For adenos, I'm doing about 3 to 4 centimeters. Um, and, I, and in terms of the leak rate uh, after neoadjuvant, we're actually uh, looked at our data from uh, esophagectomy series, and we actually were able to show that there was, we show a, a statistically significant reduction in leak, leak rate with neoadjuvant um, in the patients that underwent laparoscopic esophagectomy. Um, we didn't see that in the open. So now the surgeons are doing more kind of like minimally invasive. Um, I think, you know, the perioperative complications and morbidity associated with neoadjuvant treatment is also going to be uh, significantly reduced. But in terms of the margins, uh, I probably go three to four centimeters for adeno, and you know, like Dr. Haddock says, I, I tend to go about still five centimeters for squame. And then I'm, I'm sorry, one final question. It, 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 it's hard for me to get my head around the importance of increasing the dose to the tumor that you're going to cut it out. You know, you're treating subclinical disease, and it's not like you're increasing resectability. I mean, what difference does it make if you stop at 50 or 60, you're cutting it out? For some reason, that 10 gray seems to make a huge difference. Um, but maybe it's just the selection, because the people who responded, you know, at 60 gray, they had a complete response. Well, they're still a responder at 50 gray. Maybe it wasn't a complete response pathologically, but hey, you're cutting it out. So I just I wonder why that's so important. So, you know, the trials comparing in squamous cell, uh, the role of surgery and survival, the trials actually used doses of 60 gray. Um, and it wasn't fraught with a lot of toxicity um, or, or high rates of um, post-op mor mortality either after esophagectomy. Ideally, these patients will get chemotherapy along with their radiation, but it's not uncommon from time to time our patients don't get chemotherapy for one reason or another. What doses would you recommend for those patients who are not getting surgery and not getting chemotherapy? So uh, if they're not getting chemotherapy, they're not going to be cured. Um, so really then you're talking about doing radiation in a palliative uh, setting. So I've been doing, uh, initially I was doing just 2.5 to 3750, uh, and they seem to do okay in, in that regard. I've started because of our good experience with uh, dose painting. I'll still do the 2.5 to 3750, but I'll probably just give the gross disease with a small margin, like 3 to 45, and I found that that's actually, they tolerate that very well, and I haven't seen any strictures doing that. I'd probably give them 3,010 uh, if they're not going to get any chemotherapy. If they're going to get single-agent chemo, I've had some patients where Medical oncology is willing to give them capecitabine or Zolota, but not two drug chemo. Then I give them 60 gray. My question is: uh, Has the use of PET scanning changed how you have treated um, nodal disease or potential nodal disease? I mean, I think it's changed the staging. It hasn't really changed how I treat nodal disease, uh, other than sometimes you see nodes that. Uh, or maybe detect disease that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. That's not too common on PET, though. Usually what you see with PET is you, you weed out the occult liver met patients that are seen only on PET but not seen on CT scan. So I wouldn't say it's really changed my radiation volumes at all. I think the only time it really has is if I see actually tumor is kind of extending more into GE junction than I could appreciate, and I may just modify, you know, how I delineate GTV, but not it hasn't affected nodal. And then lastly, on patients with very low volume metastatic disease, 
Um, what are your treatment regimens? Do you use any of this technology of simultaneous integrated boost um, to jack up the dose um, in areas of gross disease? So we were, we've been seeing kind of um, more than a handful of patients that have had an excellent response to chemotherapy at the metastatic sites, but not at the primary site. And in those patients, we were then just going, if, if they were kind of cleared metastatically from the chemo, but still had residual primary disease, then we were consolidating primary with chemo radiation. I've given 30, 30 gray and 10 with chemo in patients just as a palliative treatment, and oftentimes they have complete response, at least in the volume that we treat. They're not cured, but some of them live a long time. 